Hi everyone, today I'm going to be presenting to you our work on the use of Cartesian genetic programming and shoreline forecasting in a genetic improvement setting. So to start off, uh, I'd like to give a bit of context. So coastal zones are natural ecosystems. They are highly dense and highly populated areas and they're centers for human activity. And this makes them very important areas for different societal, ecological and economical factors. However, coastal zones are undergoing constant pressures and increasing pressures that are both uh, natural and human caused. Uh, and so what we're focusing on within the scope of this project is the ability to forecast shoreline change based on coastal wave activity. So generally speaking, coastal waves, they cause this cycle that can be seen on the, in the graph on the left. So starting from a normal beach profile with a stable wave climate, uh, we have an extreme event or simply larger than average waves. Uh, and as these waves approach the shore, they start breaking and this leads the sediment grains to start moving more offshore, essentially causing coastal erosion. Uh, and then once the, once, we, once the wave climate goes back to normal, these smaller waves start pushing the sediment grains back on shore. So essentially they start uh, reconstructing the, the beach in a recovery phase. What we see here on the right are graphs that are borrowed from a sister study. Uh, and so this shows the, the shoreline variation over multiple years on two sites, so in the US and in France. Uh, and this is to show this cycle of erosion and accretion that we observe. For the remainder of the study, I will first talk about the study zone and the data set that we use. I will describe briefly the different existing methods used to perform shoreline forecasting. And then I will move on to our proposal to using CGP in order to perform this task. Uh, so I will describe the different experiments that we did and the results that we obtained. And I will conclude with some future directions. So the study sites uh, in this work, we focused on Terra Beach in New Zealand. The data set that we used comes from a shoreline modeling competition called ShoreShop. Uh, so in this work, we're using the open part of the ShoreShop data set. So this corresponds to 15 years almost uh, of daily video derived shoreline positions as can be seen in the time series here in addition to different wave measurements. Uh, so the wave heights, wave periods and wave directions. Now there are three main families of methodologies uh, when speaking about shoreline forecasting. Uh, simulation based methods, these are purely physical models. They simulate uh, many of the processes that happen in the coastal zone. They couple these simulations using conservation laws and they use this formulation in order to, to forecast shoreline change. Uh, on the other hand, data-driven models are sort of the opposite. Uh, they include no physical information whatsoever. They are purely based on the data set at hand, and this makes them over, uh, prone to overfitting. Uh, finally, uh, hybrid models, they are a mixture of, the, of both methodologies, so they include uh, some type of physical knowledge in them. Meanwhile, they still use data-driven techniques to calibrate the, the, the models. What we see on the right are uh, results from the ShoreShop competition. So at the top, we see that hybrid models are able to pick up well on longer term uh, trends and shoreline behavior. Meanwhile, they pick up, they fail to pick up on the, on the short term variations in shoreline position. On the other hand, the data driven models that were included in ShoreShop, they uh, range from Kenyon's neighbors to random forests to uh, different neural architectures. Now, a general conclusion from ShoreShop was that data driven models were able to pick up well on, this, on the short term variations and short term and uh, shoreline position. However, there was a difficulty in getting these models to generalize to the forecast period. So the model that we're using uh, and we're basing our study on, it's called Shore4. So Shore4 is a hybrid model and it's based on, uh, on the concepts of beach memory and beach equilibrium. Now to better explain this, I'll use the same example from before. So as discussed previously, uh, coastal waves, they cause, they cause this cycle of coastal erosion and coastal accretion. accretion sorry. Um, so what's important to note here is that this is a continuous cycle. This is uh, as, as these events stack on top of each other, uh, 
uh, we start seeing uh, the effect of, uh, of uh, smaller scale uh, uh, or event scale extreme events on the longer term uh, trends and shoreline behavior and vice versa. So the way that shore four models beach memory uh, can be seen here in, in, here in the omega equilibrium, equilibrium equation. Uh, so the equilibrium state at a given point in time in shore four is calculated as a weighted average of this omega term within a time window of two phi days, which where phi is a is a calibrated parameter. And so going back to omega, it can be thought of as a rate of sedimentation, uh, and it's a function of the wave height, wave period, and the sediment grain uh, settling velocity. So the reasoning behind choosing shore for as a baseline in this study is that it's a very well studied model. It was studied by different groups and there are multiple variants that were proposed to account for additional coastal processes and time scales in between the wave forcing and shoreline behavior. And so the technique that we use in order to improve upon shore for it's uh, Cartesian genetic programming. Now the interest in using an evolutionary algorithm in general is that uh, EAs are considered uh, state-of-the-art in low data regimes, which we are currently in, in such in, uh, in similar studies. Um, and moving on, genetic program programming or evolutionary algorithms in general, they are considered white box approaches. Uh, and this is because we can, uh, we can, we can actually look at the, at the model itself and see exactly what it's doing. So this, in our case, this means that we can take uh, can take an, a pre-established physical model or hybrid model. We can encode it in a, as a genetic pro programming individual. We evolve this individual, and then we are able to decode the the evolved uh, individuals and understand how they are functioning. To better understand this, uh, I show here on the left the full shore four system of equations. On the right, I show the the complete CGP graph of shore 4 and in the middle it's an example subgraph taken from the full CGP shore 4 graph uh, so this subgraph is responsible for modeling the omega equilibrium uh, equation uh, so as stated previously omega equilibrium is as a function it takes uh, omega an omega time series and phi as its inputs uh, and it outputs omega equilibrium, and this is exactly what we have here, where we have omega equilibrium, the omega time series, and the and the phi parameter as inputs. We have a series of computational nodes which translate these inputs into omega equilibrium. Moving on, concerning our experimental setup, uh, so we're using the Milke skill score in order to evaluate our models during evolution. Uh, so the Milke skill score is based on the Pearson correlation, however it's modified in order to take into account the errors and model outputs compared to ground truth, and so we use it because it's a more accurate representation of model performance. Concerning our function set, we have three different categories of functions. So list processing functions, these are simply list manipulation functions. So uh, examples include uh, reversing a list or picking the first or the last index from a list. <clears throat> Second, we have scalar functions. Uh, these are responsible for, for, uh, for applying the mathematical operations within, uh, within the graph. Uh, so mathematical operations such as addition, division, multiplication, etc. And finally, we have vector operations. And these are responsible for, for performing statistical operations on either input or, co or computational vectors. Now, considering, concerning our CGP configuration, what's important to note here is that we're using a mu plus lambda genetic algorithm. And on the list here, I, uh, I list, in the table here, I list a subset of the different CGP functions, uh, CGP parameters that were set in this study. Uh, so these are really just standard CGP parameters. Now, to start off our experiments, uh, we first wanted to see the effect of the length of the time series used during evaluation on CGP's ability to find improvements upon the, the initial shore 4 model. So we tested evaluating our models on 4 years, 7 years, or 11 years. And what we found that by increasing the number of years used during evaluation, we're able to, uh, to stabilize our uh, 
<coughs> excuse me, we're able to stabilize our uh, fitness uh, fitness landscape, and uh, by increasing the, the the length of the time series, we're also able to arrive to to improvements faster. So for the remainder of this study, eleven years were used to evaluate the different individuals. Moving on. Uh, we studied the effect of different graph sizes on CGP's ability to improve upon the baseline model. Uh, so we used uh, 300 columns, 160 columns, and 80 columns uh, within a single row formulation. So 300 columns uh, corresponds to 300 computational graphs, computational nodes. Um, and this translates to the potential complexity uh, of the evolved models that CGP can can uh, can produce, and what we found is that by minimizing the number of computational nodes or possible computational nodes, uh, CGP is able to find uh, e CGP has an easier time in finding improvements upon the baseline model. So th this experiment is useful for us uh, because it informs the future experiments and future studies. Moving on, we modified the default uh, genetic algorithm uh, by including different constraints. So we implemented constraint, constraints at the evaluation level, so looking at the standard deviation of the outputs compared to our calibrated threshold. Um, in addition to uh, different mutation constraints, now the mutation constraints are interesting because they look at the graph itself and they try to eliminate uh, invalid or unfit models uh, before the evaluation step. So this is interesting because it saves a lot of computational time. So for this experiment, we tested uh, running the experiment with either no, no constraints, just the evaluation level constraints, just the mutation level constraints, and then a combination of all of them. And now, interestingly, what we found is that combining both level of constraints does not really improve, uh, does not really help CGP in finding improvements, even though using mutation constraints on their own or evaluation constraints on their own do improve the performance of CGP compared to no constraints at all. Um, so the outcome of this, uh, this experiment, uh, this also informs future studies and that for, for, for our studies, that the, it's the mutation level constraints that are doing most of the improvement. Next, we wanted to test the ability of pure CGP, or uh, essentially starting from random initialization of, of the population. Uh, we wanted to test the ability of pure CGP to arrive to competitive models uh, that are competitive either with the baseline model or with our evolved models. Now what we found is that using pure CGP, we have a very large variance in model performance at the end of evolution. Uh, however, we do arrive uh, to, to some models that have interesting, uh, interesting performances, and this, this will be described a bit later. <clears throat> what I show here uh, is a comparison between the best individuals from each of the different configurations that we tested. Um, so on top, we see the, the actual time series uh, of the, uh, the target and the predicted shorelines. Um, and at the bottom, we see uh, it's a simpler way to, to visualize these results. Essentially, it takes the, the, sh the target shoreline signal and the predicted shoreline signals. It filters the, the shoreline uh, patterns over different time scales, and we we plot here the performance over each of the different time scales. So what we see uh, over the calibration period is that the short for based models, they keep, uh, in general, they keep the same pattern as short for, and this is mainly because short for already calibrates well to the, to the time series. Now what's more interesting to us is the forecast period. And what we see in the forecast period is that we have shore 4 in pink. Uh, and what we see that shore 4 is dominant in a single time scale. Now the, the shore 4 based models, what we see is that they keep the same performance as shore 4 more or less uh, over medium time scales where shore 4 is dominant. 
uh, while still improving over the short term uh, or shorter scale uh, shorter scale variations in shoreline uh, shoreline uh, behavior and the longer term variations. Now, an interesting point here is that the best performing model actually in this plot is the randomly initialized model. However, I'd like to give a quick reminder that uh, statistically we did see that uh, using a GI formulation using Shorefor to initialize our models, we do statistically see that CGP performs better. What we see here is a comparison between the initial short for uh, graph compared to uh, two example graphs uh, that were initialized with short for. Um, and so these are the evolved graphs. And what we see in the graph in the middle, for example, is that uh, we keep a lot of the a lot of the structure of the base short for model while including small modifications and simplifications to the graph. So this specific graph, it includes modifications to the omega equilibrium calculation. Um, and on the right, it's an additional example where we see uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit more complex uh, compared to the, uh, to the model in the middle. Uh, however, we still see that the model keeps a lot of the structure from the baseline Shorefor model. Uh, and what we see interestingly is that CGP has evolved an integrated kind of a computational module near the output. Now, what I show here is a comparison between again the baseline Shorefor model and a randomly initialized model that was evolved using CGP. Uh, and so compared to what we saw previously, uh, we see here that the randomly initialized model, uh, it makes sense that at the end of evolution we have a vastly different graph uh, compared to Shore 4. Now this is another point where GI, uh, we think is, it is a, it's an argument for GI, uh, where uh, we have, we have well-performing models that are, that are perform a lot better than the baseline model uh, over different time scales while still keeping the structure of the of the initial graph and this is interesting because this is this makes the task of explaining these graphs a lot simpler compared to starting with a random initialization now to conclude uh, this work uh, showed the first steps towards using cgp in shoreline studies and shoreline forecasting studies uh, we showed that using a gi based formulation we are able to arrive to statistically higher skills compared to using pure CGP. Uh, and we, sh we were happy to show our promising first results and we believe that the results establish a basis for future work on the use of CGP in shoreline uh, change forecasting. Now, some of the future perspective we have for this work is moving from a sequential formulation of the problem to a, to a full series formulation. So essentially moving from a a recurrent, uh, a recurrent implementation of the Shorefor graph to, uh, to a pure CGP formulation where essentially instead of running the model in a sequential manner similar to a recurrent neural network, for example, we can, uh, we can uh, implement Shorefor as a CGP graph that takes in the full data set and outputs the, the complete time series of shoreline, uh, shoreline change. Now, what will be interesting to see here is uh, first, it's the, the performance difference uh, because there is an intrinsic difference between using a recurrent version of CGP and a non-recurrent version. Uh, and second, uh, I think uh, using a full series formulation will show massive, a massive gain in terms of the computational, uh, computational resources required to run these models. Additionally, we are very interested in multi-objective optimization, and especially considering different uh, different shoreline behaviors in different areas of the globe. Uh, in addition to uh, to the performances over different time scales, so a, a future direction would be to include uh, multi-objective optimization in our in our, uh, in our algorithm to see how we can uh, we can include these different sites or different time scales as different objectives. I thank you very much for your attention. This is the last slide in my presentation. Please don't hesitate to contact me on this email uh, to discuss or if you have any questions. I thank you again for your attention.